class, please take your seats. Now, your instructor, Vincent Finelli. Now, let me just ask, were there any other articles that uh, you wanted to get to before we move on to Fukushima? Um, no, I, I'm, I'm ready for Fukushima. Uh, Fukushima to me is, is, is critical to discuss. And, um, and during the discussion, we're going to need to share some of our thoughts on how to protect ourselves from, from this, uh, this overwhelming threat. Well, I went ahead and did the radiation this week. Uh, uh, again, we have to just rely that the people know how to to uh, report the meters and uh, they're working properly. But uh, <laughs> the the winner this week is Miami, Florida, with one thousand four hundred eighty five counts per minute, which is nearly three hundred times normal. <laughs> and then Little Rock comes in second. Well, wow. that's bad news because I was planning on uh, traveling toward Little Rock uh, in the next few days. Uh-oh. Now, there's, uh, there, there's no place that's really safe anymore. And, well, uh, yeah, Little Rock, uh, Colorado Springs. Um, it's up there at 1387. Lincoln, Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska, Portland, Maine, Spokane, Washington, Amarillo, Texas, Bismarck, North Dakota. North Dakota, you, know, you used to think that North Dakota would be a safe place to go. You know, not a lot of people who wants to go there. It's freezing cold. Uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. Bakersfield, California. Navajo Lake, New Mexico. Billings, Montana. These are all... Um, well over 1,100 counts per minute. Pierre, South Dakota, Tucson, Arizona, Idaho Falls, Idaho, El Paso, Texas, L.A., Los Angeles, California, San Diego, California, Anaheim, California, all over 1,100 counts per minute. Captain John Reagan's with us, and uh, we're discussing um, radiation, radiation uh, counts per minute, and uh, just, just so you know where you stand. Um, let's continue. We are talking about uh, San Diego, California. They count 11, 1122 counts per minute. And uh, going down, we've got Anaheim, California at 1119. Kearney, Nebraska at 1093. Worcester, Mass, 1078. Kansas City, Kansas, 1060. That's uh, near our neighborhood. Louisville, Kentucky, 1052, Wichita, Kansas, 1049, San Bernardino County, 1046, St. George, Utah, 1044, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 1041, Yuma, Arizona, 1039, Laredo, Texas, 1036, Memphis, Tennessee, Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, all above... Uh, 1029. And then if you get down to, you know, where things are really important, like Washington, D.C., 375. 375. The high for Washington is um, 375, and the low for Washington is 79. So it seems like uh, radiation knows that uh, the important things are going on in Washington, and uh, it needs to stay away from Washington, D.C. Can you imagine that? How does it know, John? <laughs> well, we, we might want to speculate that they've got uh, some technology, but uh, uh, we, we don't see too many high readings uh, coming to us from uh, the Northeast. Mm-hmm. You know, we've yep. got one in Massachusetts that's 1,078. Uh, and a lot of this depends on exactly what the, the weather patterns are. But it, it does uh, mm -hmm. seem strange that they're always, uh, uh, well, they're, they're always included on the list, but that they <laughs> tend to be well above, well below the uh, 1,000 counts per minute that these other cities are, 
receiving. And mm-hmm. just point out at the bottom of the list there, it says normal radiation is 5 to, t- to 20 counts per minute. So that's what the, the background radiation would be. Yeah. And obviously, even on the the low end, um, uh, DC is several times that. So they, they haven't escaped, but they, you know, for some reason, are, are not uh, high on the list. Well, let me. Uh, some of these links we actually talked about last week. I promised to post them. We don't have any more information coming out about the reactor at Leningrad. Um, these are the the two links that I have. It's a uh, Chernobyl-style uh, plant, and you can see pictures of uh, steam coming out. Um, in the first article, they've got a uh, picture of a detector that... Um, is not very high on the 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 count. Uh, of course, we don't know if uh, that's real or um, propaganda. And the second one has a, a map uh, showing where they believe the radiation cloud went, which went over to Sweden. So it's. Uh, um, it's, it's kind of frustrating, much like uh, Fukushima. We are not getting, uh, you know, official information released from the state, and we're having to um, re- rely on uh, you know, other observations. I've also got John. What an outrage! What, what yes. an outrage that uh, <clears throat> radiation uh, can leak from a reactor and poison another country that has nothing to do with that reactor nor the benefit of the electricity being generated. Isn't that amazing that that we have done this to ourselves? And we've done the same thing in the United States. We have reactors. We have reactors in one state uh, that uh, sends radiation downwind to other states. So, John, I know I know a guy who's friends with a person who works at the controls of a uh, nuclear power generation system. And I asked him, he wanted to, my friend wanted to get a job there. And I said, so what's it like? And this was maybe 15 years ago. He was telling me, oh, you just go there and you go to sleep. You can, you get paid for going to sleep. You just sit there and you can sleep at the controls. Let's continue into the Fukushima, please. And, and that's the true no child has a chance. It's Fukushima. Um, if you're just tuning in for the first time to today, uh, it was a couple of weeks ago that uh, I talked about a link where I found they'd recently released a government report that was from March 18th, 2011. This is one week after the event at Fukushima, the first event anyway. And at that time, they knew that 100% of the rods in spent fuel pool 4, 50% of pool 3, and 25% of pool 2 had already been released to the atmosphere. And pool 4, by itself, released more cesium than all the above-ground nuclear explosions combined. So that is uh, what we now know and what we're dealing with and and why I'm in the middle of uh, bringing you up to speed on on radiation and going back and taking a look at what we were told at the time and the the lies and as well as uh, other stories that uh, we had suspicions, but now that we know this, it uh, it adds more reliability to the stories. So it's uh, it's going to be an interesting journey. I still have dozens more to get through. Last week, I 
or I guess it was less yesterday. Uh, I lose track. Uh, last week it was because this was already posted for yesterday. Uh, talked about microwaves and ionizing radiation. So I included the two links. We talked about that last week, so I don't really want to uh, spend time on that again. If you missed last week, uh, you can find the archives on GCNlive.com. I uh, also talked about Dana Durnford. Uh, we're hoping he's okay. He uh, was not on not Jeff Rince's show last night, uh, and uh, Jeff was unable to reach him. But his uh, website has a, a number of pictures, and he's got uh, tons of resources where he went all along the, the west coast of America and uh, documented what things look like uh, after Fukushima. He's also got some pictures of before for comparison. And uh, his website's the nuclearproctologist.org. The link is there. And uh, you, you can uh, definitely lose a lot of time uh, looking at all of those pictures and uh, what he's produced. And especially now, uh, knowing what we know now, uh, it, it's going to be pretty hard for people to deny that uh, radiation is at least a factor, if not the cause of, of what you're seeing there. I've got a couple of uh, new news pieces. One, uh, the link is called California Plutonium. And this is uh, where a government report plutonium detected in recent California air samples uh, fallout from Fukushima nuclear accident may be to blame. The samples were apparently taken in, taken in 2014, so uh, it would not be uh, the, the the recent uh, Russian uh, situation, and I believe that would not have uh, involved the the storage facility there in the southwest. So uh, I would say again, Fukushima is probably the uh, the likelihood there. There was this discussion last night about uh, tritium. And I'm going to uh, add s several more articles on that uh, for next time. Uh, tritium is uh, basically a, a hydrogen atom that has two neutrons in the nucleus. And when that breaks down, you end up getting uh, beta radiation. And one of the reasons I posted this link uh, this time is it kind of dovetails with the measuring radiation. They have a nice chart there uh, talking about Becquerel's, Curie's, uh, and getting down further in the list, Sievert's, uh, Rems. And it's still a, a mess trying to uh, sort out all the measurements. Uh, some of these are just the, the measures of radioactivity, and others consider uh, what the effective dosage would be. And uh, I'm going to continue working on this part as well to see if I can put together something that might be a, a little bit uh, easier to understand, but at least I've, I've put up... Uh, the several sources that uh, that explain it from different angles. Uh, what really disturbs me about tritium, it's probably going to be the the most common radionuclide released from Fukushima. Uh, you know, hydrogen being a part of water, you end up. Uh, commonly getting this in, in water. And in fact, low amounts of tritium are just plain naturally produced by the <laughs> the way things work in, in physics and nature. But when you have these excessive amounts, uh, you, you get it uh, 
two ways, or I guess actually like technically three ways. One is the exposure to the radiation. Uh, beta radiation, again, is uh, not very critical so long as you don't ingest or inhale it. Well, <laughs> this is going into the water supply. So when you drink that, it's going into your body. And I guess the good news about what you drink, it's only there for about 10 days. But when you eat something that has it, it can be in your body for 10 years. Captain John Reagan's with us. We're talking about Fukushima. And uh, class, this, this uh, hour is Fukushima 104. Previous broadcasts are 101, 102, 103. This is 104. Class Captain John Reagan's with us, and uh, John, we're talking about tritium. And I went to the internet during the break, and I was looking up products that were made with tritium. And so there, there's some jewelry items that kind of glow in the dark, and uh, there are some lights that kind of glow in the dark. There are watch faces and dials, compass faces and dials uh, that glow in the dark. Trinkets and toys and things that you would uh, give to your children because they're neat to look at, and they glow in the dark. And uh, so I was looking at that and I was quite alarmed. I I remember the uh, the radium dials on watches and the a lot of our United States watchmakers had uh, watch faces that had these little dots of radioactive materials that uh, would glow in the dark so you could kind of see the, the minute and uh, hour hand uh, in the dark, and you could see these dots that would illuminate the hour, so you could kind of read your watch uh, in the dark. And so I then went and I posted this part on the internet on usaprepares.com. Uh, it's a tritium information, and it says tritium is a radioactive form of hydrogen, as you said. It's used in research, fusion reactors, and neutron generators. The radioactive properties of tritium are very useful. By mixing tritium with a chemical that emits light in the presence of radiation, a phosphor, a continuous light source is made. This can be applied to a situation where dim light is needed, but where batteries or electricity is not possible or practical. Rifle sights and exit signs are two examples of uh, where this phenomenon is commonly used. The phosphor uh, sites help increase nighttime firing accuracy, and the exit signs can be a lifesaver if there's a loss of power. The radioactive decay product of tritium is a low-energy beta that cannot penetrate the outer layer of human skin. Therefore, the main hazard associated with tritium is internal exposure from inhalation or ingestion, as you said. The, um, in addition, due to the relatively long half-life and short biological half-life, uh, an intake of tritium must be in large amounts to pose a significant health risk. Although keeping with the philosophy, uh, internal exposure should be kept as low as practical. Now, as I think about this, John, I think about these mm, these items ending up in a landfill. Okay, we just uh, throw them away, put them in the trash. We don't know that they're radioactive. We don't think about it, and uh, then they go in the landfill. And then what happens? Uh, the um, the bulldozers and the Track loaders go over them with these heavy steel tracks and smash them, and and then these particles are released. Just you know, one more, one more thing to be concerned about. Uh, again, what I talked about is the ingestion is is where mm -hmm. the problem is. Right. And just to reiterate, drinking tritium water is not going to be quite as bad for you. Yes, you're going to be getting radiation. But it's like a 10-day span. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is when you eat uh, the animals that have ingested this and it hasn't been eliminated from their system, you know, they're, they're run through processing, you, you get the animal meat, you eat the meat. Now you got the issue that that radiation is going to be in your body for 10 years where it can do much more damage. And there are plenty of animals at landfills. 
really. Um, you see birds flying over them, and uh, you see um, other small animals flying over them. Yeah, I'm sorry, not flying over them, uh, traveling over them. And, um, John, we don't even know what's in our landfills. Well, actually, we do. In one landfill just outside of St. Louis, we know that it's radioactive and there's a fire right next to it, about a thousand feet away. Captain John Reagan and I will be back right after the top of the hour news and commercial announcements with Fukushima 105. Second hour today of Fukushima. John, uh, do you have any highlights? I uh, will like start off with uh, measuring radiation and getting into the history. There you go. We'll be right back. Everyone all set, cocked, locked. Hour number two of USAPrepares.com. Captain John Reagan's with us. This is Fukushima 105. Captain John Reagan, um, where do you want to where do you want to begin this hour? Well, we need to understand a little bit about how radiation is measured, and it's uh, uh, kind of complicated a, a little bit because of the metric system. Because there's uh, basically two terms for every type of measurement. The metric system side, uh, uh, System International, and that's abbreviated SI. So when I talk about an SI unit, that's the, the metric system part of it. When we measure uh, radiation being given off or emitted, the original conventional unit was the Curie. Uh, of course, named after the scientist Marie Curie. The SI unit conversion is the Becquerel. We've heard that a lot in the reports. And and that's basically telling you how many uh, you know, counts are being, how many <laughs> decays counts are being emitted per second. So when we're talking about, you know, these huge numbers, billions of becquerels, that's, uh, yeah, again, one of those large numbers that, that's hard for us to understand. It, um, it also tends to be associated with um, uh, a volume of water that they talk about either per liter or per cubic meter uh, of water. So we, we end up having to do some conversions when we're trying to compare different reports. But what is being emitted is different than the radiation dose that is absorbed by a person. And that is counted using the RAD or the metric unit, SI unit called the gray. And, um, you may even have radiation detectors that measure RADs, which is to give you an idea of how much you've been exposed to. But to go beyond that, you also have to define the biological risk of the exposure to radiation. Those are measured in REMS or the SI unit called the sievert. And sievert's a, a pretty large number, so a lot of times you'll hear millisievert, which again gets into <laughs> the math. So the, the the conversion of the units, just to make sure you're talking about the same thing, uh, is enough to drive a person crazy, even if you're a numbers person. Uh, I've got that from the CDC. I've got uh, another one from Oak Ridge Laboratory. Um, they've got the Oak Ridge has the charts with the the, the prefixes and uh, the conversion rates. I've got uh, another link, IEEER, Institute for Energy and Environmental Research, and they talk about, uh, in addition to measuring, they talk about the alpha, the beta, the gamma, and the neutrons. And then um, the next one, NEI, is the Nuclear Energy Institute. I, I just gave you the different resources because they explain it in a little different way, and, and sometimes 
Um, just having the, the different perspective helps. And I took one that was not a, uh, um, a more official type source from LiveScience.com. And that uh, tends to be written more for people that follow scientists, science that aren't really scientists. But the other thing I found out looking at these numbers, the, the biological risk part, the REM or the sievert, that's basically calculated for your exposure to radiation not the inhalation and ingestion of radiation. And that's, again, a further consideration because that's what we are getting at the low levels um, through our air, our water, and our food. And do you have any questions on... That I'm not sure I can answer. Yeah, John, I'm, 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 I'm not a physicist. I'm, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking at the uh, the link. How is radiation exposure measured? And uh, the first sentence of this article, um, LiveScience.com, says about, and the date was uh, March 15, 2011. There's about 150 people living or working around Japan's damaged nuclear facilities have been monitored for potential radiation exposure, and 23 have been found to be in need of treatment. Now, that's one in six, John. That, yeah. That's a lot. That's a very high percentage. There and, was a <clears throat> lot of radiation released just mm-hmm. in that initial event. Mm-hmm. And um, it says people don't absorb all the radiation they're exposed to. However, most of it passes straight through their bodies. A small amount of the energy carried by radiation gets absorbed by body tissues, and that absorbed amount is measured in units of radiation absorbed uh, RADs. And uh, it affects different people in different ways, but a rule of thumb used uh, by safety crews is that a single rentagen of gamma or x-ray exposure typically produces uh, an absorbed dose of approximately one rad. By measuring the radiation level around a person's body, um, using a Geiger counter, uh, a safety officer can approximate that person's absorbed dose. Now, that's why why people wear these radiation... Um, Badges that that uh, collect the amount of exposed radiation and report it, so that someone who can read these badges can say you've had X amount of exposure. That's too much or not enough, or we can send you back in there to get some more. Um, <clears throat> but my understanding from discussing this with Matt Stein and, and you and others that is that Fukushima, uh, the radiation levels are so high that we don't have electronics that can sustain that level of radiation without being damaged. Here's what I'm saying. We cannot at this point make a robot that we can shield with enough protection to let the electronics, the servos, the computers on these robots to to uh, go in and survey what's going on at, at these reactors. We can't even make the equipment work because the radiation levels are so high. So it's difficult to fix it um, because the humans who would be piloting these pieces of equipment if they actually went in uh, to operate the equipment, let's say a bulldozer or something, um, that's a death sentence for them. The machines can't take it. We can't take it. Nothing that we know of can survive this. Is that right? That's uh, basically what it boils down to. We do not have the technology uh, currently existing to... (laughs) To, to even go in and explore for any significant period of time, um, much less try to remediate it. Mm-hmm. Okay, do you have any thoughts on what we should do at this point to protect ourselves from the radiation that is all over the planet? I know that Dr. Sheely talks about iodorol and using um, you know, iodine supplements, 
And uh, I even asked him about something that I bought for our animals here at the farm. And you can get this from a veterinary supply uh, house or even maybe a, your veterinarian. And it's called triiodine. And uh, Dr. Shuley said that uh, you, know, you can take something like a Q-tip and put it on your skin in uh, the area uh, about one square inch or one inch in diameter, which is roughly the size of a, a, a standard postage stamp. So you could spread that on your skin. And um, if it's absorbed you know, within a week, then you need more. Uh, if it's not, you're okay. You have enough iodine. Uh, that's what that's what I believe he was saying, and I'll ask him again tomorrow uh, about that for as a reminder. But that's just one inexpensive way of doing it. But but John, is there, do you have any other thoughts as to how we can pre- protect ourselves? You know, well, the the good news about the iodine is that does help to protect your thyroid, and we are typically deficient in iodine anyway, and you need to cut out your fluoride so that. It's not pushing out the iodine to make bad thyroid hormone with. Uh, I might also just add uh, a a good place to uh, paint the iodine on yourself is the the sole of your foot, and that way, um, you know it's you you know it's out of sight and uh, uh, it's probably not going to mess up any clothes or anything. Uh, either wearing socks or, uh, you know, your, your shoes going to uh, probably have uh, uh, a dark layer uh, where your foot goes into it or, you know, something that's going to be hidden anyway that you don't even care if it uh, uh, ends up with a little bit of iodine on it. When we come back, I'll tell you where I found some triiodine 7 and uh, it's available in 16 ounce bottles. The price is about $12. I'll tell you a little bit about that when we come back. Class, I just posted um, Try Iodine 7, uh, where you can get it. Now, I have no financial interests. I don't even know this company, but I found, uh, I found a source for $10.95. It's called QC, QC Supply. Put a link on the website so, just so you can see what this product is, and you can find it locally if you'd like. Uh, but it's uh, ten dollars ninety-five cents for a bottle of sixteen ounces. That is what I have. I bought it from a veterinary supply for our animals, and it's a triple source iodine tincture for use as an antiseptic and disinfectant. And uh, it's safe for uh, newborn animals, superficial wounds, cuts, abrasions, and uh, insect bites. 16 ounces, $10.95. Jim in Arkansas, welcome. Good morning, Vince. Um, I've been listening to your show here a little bit. I've been sort of busy this morning, but uh, uh, of course, I talked to you last night about what I had found out about your uh, uh, not being able to figure out why your belts and your hoses were breaking, and I, and I think I struck on a, on a source for that which we discussed a little bit. And uh, did you want me to talk about that or? Yes, yes, please do. Uh, you're on with Captain John Reagan, and uh, you probably know John Reagan from the meetups. And so, Jim, uh, you've been you've been to the meetups, and uh, I really thank you for the call. And, and what you've done is you've helped uh, us connect some dots. So please share with us uh, the Wigner effect. And let me spell that for the class, W-I-G. N-E-R, and I'll post a link right now as Jim is discussing this on the air. Okay, well, um, basically, when I was at the meetings, um, uh, Mr. Finelli was always bringing up how he saw all over the road, and of course I did too because I was traveling back and forth a lot to Georgia, observing the same things, of pieces of rubber off tires, uh, uh, fan belts laying there in the road, and, and uh, this goes on for miles at a time. So when he mentioned that he was having problems at the farm, I started digging on the internet and found this man by the name of Vigner. It's actually like he just spelled with a W. Uh, but he's a, his name is uh, Dr. Eugene Vigner. And originally back in the 40s and 50s, he set up the standards for uh, nuclear power plants 
and, and their their longevity. And so what he had come up with was when the radiation gets on certain surfaces, whether it's concrete or steel or aluminum or rubber, the Wigner effect takes place and it actually goes into the molecules of whatever it's sitting on. And of course, last night, Vince and I were talking about airplanes and um, the planes, unfortunately, whenever you take a plane ride, you're being exposed to very, very high levels of radiation because it's, it's up there floating around. In fact, something that I didn't mention last night, Vince, was that uh, I had done some research also that I found out when we saw years ago when we were kids, we saw these bomb blasts, nuclear blasts out in Las Vegas or Vegas area in the desert. <clears throat> and we saw these big mushrooms, and then we saw in the background all these thousands of troops standing there watching this. Well, this was just another test being done of the, of the guinea pig to see what their reactions were. And unfortunately, I found out that the particles, the cesium, the strontium, all these different terrible things, are still in the toposphere uh, floating around. In fact, 85% of those are still floating up there. And of course, this is where all the storms originate uh, out of the toposphere and then drop these particles down, like sort of like a salt shaker. And uh, as you travel in an airplane, uh, you get exposed to these. I could sort of give you a picture of like a bag of, of uh, poisons floating around. Well, some of these bags contain some of the real bad stuff, actually hot particles, that you don't want to breathe. And then there's other bags where it's not so harmful. And this is what I found traveling across the United States um, with my Geiger counter. I have a, I have a, what I feel is one of the best, it's a maser. And um, <clears throat> it registers highs and lows and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, during rainstorms, um, I was in Billings, Montana here a few months back, and I was registering 72 millirim, uh consistently in that area. And uh, I hear the music. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, you do. And uh, can you please hold through the bottom of the hour break? And uh, Captain John Reagan, Jim uh, in Arkansas, and I will be right back. This is USA Prepares, and this is Fukushima 105. Class, we're talking about uh, Fukushima. This is Fukushima 105 in the series. And I thought uh, at first there would be, you know, a uh, one day special, then a two day special, and then we're up to five five one hour broadcasts. And uh, I don't think we're going to be done with five hours. And so this this will continue, and we'll keep you posted uh, as more and more Fukushima broadcasts unfold. Jim in Arkansas has John, uh, joined John Rake and, and me. And you, Jim, you were talking about the Wigner effect, and also that you were traveling with a. Um, Geiger counter. Please continue. Yeah, and of course, wherever I go, I, I take readings uh, when it's raining and, and when it's not. And of course, um, it is always heavier, uh, higher rating, more millirem uh, when it's raining. There's no doubt about that. So it is coming down uh, with with the weather. Um, also, uh, I don't want to, I, I want to stay on point here with this Wigner effect. Um, what happens is the the, the uh, radiation actually goes into the the particles or the cells, we'll call them, of, of the material. And uh, you can picture these as little balls that are all hooked together or bumped together. And then what happens is the radiation kills like 10 of these balls. Well, pretty soon after a period of time, you've got like a honeycomb effect inside the aluminum or plastic or whatever, and you really can't see it like rust or something on the outside. Uh, there's no visual effect, uh, but when you find out when it happens, uh, you have what they call incidents in airplanes where the skin starts peeling off the aircraft or a turbine in one of those GE engines uh, explodes on takeoff. Uh, just last week, there was a, a plane, I forget what it was, 757 came in for a landing and the nose gear collapsed. Well, it's probably from the hydraulic hoses, excuse me, from the Wigner effect. And so all these incidents are happening, and if, if you start looking them up, um, 
<clears throat> they're not really what they call, you know, major crashes or anything. They're incidents. Well, these incidents are by the thousands. And uh, it's all happened since Fukushima. So we had the radiation in the air. It was floating around. But this, this Fukushima has really put the icing on the cake. And, of course, now what I'm worried about is uh, this uh, one in Russia, Leningrad here. Now they sent everybody home. And there's no, there's, you can't pull up anything on, uh, there's no information. So that makes me a little leery. Uh, we don't really need another incident. And, uh, of course, Vince, you're right up there with your, your 240 acres sitting right near that, uh, St. Louis dump, which if something happens up there, I don't know what we're going to do, but, uh, it, it's, it's really a sad situation we're in. And, uh, I think the key is to keep our immune system high. Um, you know, like you said, take the iodine, uh, and, and, uh, you know, the diatomaceous earth. There's, there's several other products that are out and just try to stay healthy. And of course, stay out of the rain. Uh, your hair absorbs cesium and all that stuff, just like a, like a sponge. So I always warn the women, especially because they usually have a big head of hair that'll really absorb a lot. So. You know, the days of walking in the rain is over. Uh, and the other thing I was going to mention, Vince, that I've looked up uh, is HEPA filters. I don't know whether you've read anything about that. Uh, they're good for your house. They're very expensive. Uh, but again, the same kind of thing. If you're taking filters in and out of your unit, you may want to use some goggles and maybe a mask. And I know you work out a lot. I wanted to talk to you last night and forgot. Uh, I've been doing some research on some masks that are affordable and uh, you really should be with the hours you spend outside you should, because you're going to be picking up hot particles. Uh, and of course you don't need that and nobody does. And the other thing I was thinking about that came to mind is here we see these bikers out flying around on their bikes with no helmet, no nothing on, you know, and they're breathing that air. They're just running through those plumes, and they haven't got a clue of how dangerous it is. And so, um, you know, just the things that we take for granted, uh, we have to really be aware anymore. And uh, these particles that are coming down, unfortunately, like on your land up there, you've got all that beautiful cattle and everything, and they're just uh, going around uh, eating the grass and stuff like that. So. You know, it's a shame, uh, but we're all trying to eat organic and everything. And, and uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is we're in a mess here where we really need to band together and try to figure this out. We need people like Dr. Miller, your other doctor there in Missouri, uh, anyone we can get to get information to uh, figure out how to best uh, protect our families and, and uh, preserve our life a little bit because we're in, we're in deep duty. Jim, uh, if you could see me when I go out on the tractor, I wear uh, like a, a jumpsuit, something that a mechanic would wear in the 1960s. Uh, zip up, you know, zip up uh, on each leg up to my knees so, uh, so I can get my, my boots through the, the jumpsuit. I put that on. Uh, I've got a summer weight one and, and a winter weight one. I wear goggles, safety glasses. Uh, I wear a respirator, I wear a hat. You know, when the neighbors see me, they must they must think I'm an absolute nut. Uh, when I'm going down the road on the tractor, I wear a respirator, goggles, jumpsuit. <clears throat> and it, it, it probably doesn't look normal to most of these farmers who are, you know, just out there with their ball cap on and, and their uh, overalls. You know, they're, they're, uh, bib type overalls well you're just ahead of the curve unfortunately what they don't know is is they'll probably be coming to their funeral you know so. it's really it's really really sad and and um it's hard not to be angry it's hard not to be angry because the people whom we've entrusted to protect us from these things are are generating these um these devices, they're building these devices, they're testing these devices on we the villagers, and it's an outrage with, without our permission. I'm not signing up for this. I'm not agreeing to this. I certainly don't want my cows to be infected, 
and uh, <clears throat> irradiated and uh, chemically poisoned. I, I certainly don't want that, but there's no escape. There's no escape I, I can think of. Even, even in the studio, which is inside a stone house, which is really weather stripped. I mean, it, it, it doesn't, our house doesn't leak very much in terms of air. And the, the uh, civil defense uh, survey meter, the dosimeter that I have, uh, is pegged off the, off the scale. I'm going to reset it and see how fast it, it goes off the scale again. That's inside. Inside, windows closed. How does it yeah. happen? It's, it's all well, around it, us, as it you say. It comes in on everything. Even if you have a pet that comes near in the house and your shoes, you know, the old Japanese uh, yeah. custom of taking the shoes off, boy, that's the best yeah. thing because you're tracking that stuff right in the house. Yeah, and uh, another thing, uh, as, as a, uh, you know, we, we can complain about this, but let's have a solution. And here's something that I've done here at the house, and, and I'll share this with our, our broadcast uh, classroom. When we were building this house, I decided that I picked up some um, uh, surplus materials to build a central vacuum system. So for less than $100, I got most of the plumbing, the fittings, everything I needed to build a central vacuum system for our house. And I, and I put it in, I roughed it in. And then, you know, I found out that, you know, central vacuum system can cost three, four, five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars $8,000. And that's crazy. But what you can do <clears throat> is you can hook that thing up to a shop vac. And you can have that shop vac air the dust outside. You know, like let's say you you have the pipes uh, end up in your garage and you open the garage door and you have a, a flexible um, vacuum hose and hook the shop vac up outside the garage door. Now you're venting all that dust that you pick up outside. Because the last thing you want to do is redistribute that dust with a standard vacuum cleaner, right? And Excellent. that's what they do. Yep. yep. And then And then I found on Craigslist... Uh, there was a woman uh, about three or four or five hours away that had just decided she put in the central vac and she didn't want it. And so she sold us the vacuum. It was like all, almost brand new. And so I hooked that up and I vented that outside. So now what we do is we have this central vac and the whole thing probably ended up costing about $400, which is the price of maybe less than the cost of a, a vacuum that you might buy at Sears. You know, one that you drag around with the a short hose, right? So, Excellent move. Yep. Well, and, and, the, and, and if you saw the amount of dust that goes out through the bag of a canister vacuum cleaner or an upright vacuum cleaner, it's unbelievable. It's a dust relocation system for the small pieces. And those are the ones we're concerned about, the radioactive ones and these other chemicals that are airborne. So I think that we might want to try that. One other thing that we can share is the the furnace filters, what I do is I spray them with end dust, just a light, light coat of end dust, which causes an electrostatic charge on the standard furnace filters. I'm talking about the ones that have the, like the fiberglass, um, uh, fiberglass element, if you will. And with a, a light coating of end dust, uh, it attracts dust like crazy. Then what I do is I find, when I, when I clean them, I put a respirator and goggles and all that stuff on the, the jumpsuit. And I very carefully take them outside so I don't drop any dust inside the house. I take them outside. First, I determine which way the wind's blowing. And I blow them out with compressed air. And I look like I'm, you know, I'm ready for a moon landing. So with, you know, in terms of what I'm wearing. And I make sure the animals are nowhere near us. And the wind is blowing away from the house. And it's going to blow away from where we are. And I just blow that out with a compressor. And then I lightly coat them with end dust again and... Back in they go, and and my logic is this: my logic is that we'll have the the uh, freedom from a lot of um, restriction of the HEPA filter. We'll have the electrostatic charge on the filter because of the end dust, and it seems to work really, really, really well. And that that's what I've done here at our home. Yeah. Now I don't know if it's the best way to go, or it's just well, it's, it's certainly one way to go. And I have not replaced a furnace filter in ten years. The throwaway filters, I've got, I still have them, and they work great, and they collect dust. Did you have something else you wanted to share, Jim? No, I think I'm pretty well set for today. I just uh, wanted to touch base with what I had, and uh, I sure enjoy well, your show. So keep up the good work, man. Jim, thank you so much for, for being with us today. 
and um, we appreciate your advice and counsel. And Captain John Reagan's with us. And uh, class during the and during the break, you didn't hear it. I asked John John Reagan um, about continuing this this series. We're up to one zero five right now on Fukushima, and uh, where will it be going? And John, where where will it be going? Well. Like I say, I've, I've got uh, a number of links on tritium. I have a number of links about the USS Reagan and what happened to its sailors. I've got a number of links about uh, how this radiation makes it to the southern hemisphere, uh, in addition to the history as things went along with the lies we were told. So <laughs> we, we have a ways to go. Okay. So, class, we're going to continue this. Um, the next, the next in the series on Fukushima will be Monday, uh, next Monday. And that'll be 106. Uh, John, you mentioned that uh, you're furious about it. You want to share what that means? Well, you know, the government made a decision not to tell us that this is happening. So, whatever we could have done to possibly protect ourselves, they took that option away from us. And mm -hmm. you know, I say, uh, I've been in this for two weeks now, and, and I'm still furious. Um, and it's, it's not a uh, position I like being in. I don't see any answers at this point. Uh, the, the best thing you can do is whatever you can do to uh, give your body good nutrition and support. But so much of uh, what we've learned about protecting ourselves from radiation is that in, the, in the picture of having a nuclear event, whether it's uh, you know what we thought of World War, where you know nukes are sent over, or uh, like Chernobyl, which uh, they were able to shut down and encase, so the event stopped. What we have here is an ongoing event, which makes this so much more difficult. Uh, with the iodine, the idea was to, to saturate your thyroid with iodine before the radioactive got here so it wouldn't uptake it. Well, with the ongoing event, now you're having to compete with the radioactive, so you can't just saturate it with the iodine, but at least you can try and... Uh, let your body pick and, you know, kind of like a lottery. And if you have more of the good stuff in there versus the radioactive, you can just hope that it picks up the good stuff versus the radioactive. It's more difficult with these other radionuclides we've talked about. Cesium uh, looks like calcium. Excuse me, it looks like uh, potassium. Strontium looks like calcium. Uh, tritium looks like water, so it can literally go anywhere. And if you try to take something to absorb it, then you're going to have a problem of uh, you know, getting your, your calcium and your potassium and your nutrition. If you take something to try to chelate it, again, you're going to be taking calcium and potassium out of your system. So that's why you want the medical assistance uh, to make sure that you're putting enough good stuff back in to take <laughs> to replace what was taken out while trying to get rid of the bad stuff. So it, it really is a difficult situation. And, uh, uh, yeah, we'll continue to discuss it. You know, John, it's really difficult to have a smile on our face when we're talking about this. It really is. And um, class, tomorrow... Dr. Norman Shealy is scheduled to be with us, and uh, I'll ask him about what we can do and what his thoughts are, because this is such an overwhelming threat to, uh, to our lives, and our animals' lives, and our food supply, and the air we breathe, and the water we drink. It's just all around us. Captain John Reagan, thank you so much for all your effort and the hard work on this subject. Class above all honesty and integrity.